Does your commuter rail system have one line, that one line that just stands out from the rest of the system for one reason or another? Whether it be due to short lengths, low ridership, odd placement, or just straight up different. Well, I'm here to point out this line, go over its history, explain why it's so odd, and what can be done to fix it. All of this and more in this episode of Fixing Your Branch Line. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Fixing Your Branch Line. The series where I casually call out a branch line for being somewhat different, go over its history and flaws, and suggest what can be done to fix it. Since the last episode's honorable mention was a line that was shared by both Metro North and New Jersey Transit, this episode will be continuing where the last one left off by reviewing the next closest rail to the previous one, NJT. Established for the same reasons as Metro North, this agency was created a few years earlier in 1979 to not only take over Excom rail commuter lines, but also the local bus services in the state, with the agency officially taking over rail operations in 1983. Once again, as a single entity taking over all remaining commuter rail routes in the state, this railroad can be split up into two divisions, the Hoboken Division consisting of former Erie Lackawanna lines, and the Newark Division consisting of everything else. So since this series covers branch lines that just blatantly stand out, as indicated by literally the first example used in the intro, is none other than the Atlantic City Line. As shown by the system map, this line is the only route that is straight up isolated from the rest of the system no commuter rail connections to it whatsoever. Well, technically NJT operates the River Line light rail that connects it with the Northeast Corridor Line, but that doesn't count since it's a light rail. Art in complete isolation as the only Newark division line to not actually stop at Newark, this route has the lowest ridership in the entire system, has the fewest amount of stops on the branch with the furthest distances between stops, has most of its branch single tracked, uses some of the oldest equipment with the shortest consists, and is the only line to serve southern New Jersey, including the famous Atlantic City. But despite all of this, the Atlantic City line has one of the most interesting and overlooked histories of any line in the NJT system. So let's dive right in. Our story starts at the branch's namesake terminus of Atlantic City, the Coney Island of New Jersey and the Las Vegas of the East. Oddly enough, plans to develop the land into the resort and casino-filled city hugging the Atlantic Ocean didn't arise until 1850, with the town itself being incorporated four years later, and conveniently the same year its first rail line served it, the Camden and Atlantic Railroad. As a matter of fact, this line proved to be so popular that a narrow gauge route was built parallel to the existing one by the Philadelphia and Atlantic City Railway. This railroad would later be acquired by the Reading, and the original Camden and Atlantic would be acquired by the Pennsylvania along with multiple smaller railroads in the southern New Jersey region, with these lines technically being operated by a Pennsy subsidiary called the West Jersey and Seashore Railroad, thus expanding the fierce rivalry between the Pennsylvania and the Reading past the city limits of Philadelphia and into New Jersey. Later added into the race for Atlantic City would be the Central Railroad of New Jersey, whose famous Blue Comet train provided direct service from the greater New York region into Atlantic City. However, the financial losses of the other South Jersey branch lines caused the Pennsylvania Reading to consolidate their operations in the region in 1933, thus forming the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines, which resulted in a unique mixture of Pennsy and Reading steam engines, coaches, and diesels, with consists ranging from 2 to 12 cars long. Atlantic City had an 8-track Union Station and Atlantic Avenue, along with a bunch of sporadic yards according to the Rail Guide app, thus having plenty of capacity for the vast amount of passenger trains entering the city through one of three alignments, one of which including a fully electrified route with overhead trolley wires and third rail. However, an often overlooked aspect of this line's history is its connection to Philadelphia. Although there were some express runs that ran from Atlantic City to Philadelphia Broad Street via Frankfurt Junction, most trains to America's playground originated at Camden, where passengers would transfer to either a short ferry ride or the Bridge Line subway on the Delaware River Bridge, later known as the Benjamin Franklin Bridge, with the latter option being available at Broadway Street instead of the next stop at Camden Terminal. Yet, this bridge also carried cars over the river, which introduced a new form of competition against the rails, thus showcasing the beginning of the end for the line's popularity. What's worse is that the line had two primary factors that led to its demise, the first being the popularity of the car in America, and the second being the more exquisite destinations offered by the locational freedom of the car. Trains on the PRSL were shortened to a single RDC as the main line on the original Camden and Atlantic was downgraded to commuter service offered by NJ Dot. Then, a subway expansion would change the commuter line forever, as the Port Authority Transit Corporation, 
or PATCO, purchased former PRSL trackage from Camden to Lindenwood in 1969, thus severing the heavy rail route from Camden and forced the line to truncate at Lindenwood for a transfer to PATCO. This transfer proved to be so unpopular with passengers that the Atlantic City Line became one of the only NJ Dock commuter rail lines to cease operations in 1981, right around the formation of New Jersey Transit's rail division. But not all was lost for the city on the Atlantic, however. Almost immediately after its closure, there were numerous discussions to bring rail service back to the famed Atlantic City, especially now that the rise in casino gambling was bringing in a new wave of tourism to the area. Thankfully, Amtrak proposed a brand new and frequent service to revitalize stations on the original Camden Atlantic line, with test runs starting a good two years before NJDOT ceased commuter service. However, this line would diverge soon after Lindenwood and divert onto the Taylor Bridge and into Philadelphia 30th Street Station, where it would continue to run to various destinations on the Northeast Corridor, including Richmond, Springfield, and Harrisburg. With this intercity service also came a local New Jersey Transit commuter service, which stopped at multiple brand new high-level platform stations, including Atco, Hamilton, Egg Harbor City, and Abiscon. Both services commenced in 1989 with the terminus having an impressive five-track station built as part of the Atlantic City Convention Center, with most of NJT's service just being a shuttle between Lindenwood and Atlantic City, and only a few trains running into Philly. But Amtrak moved their local stop to a brand new station named Cherry Hill in 1994, and the expansive but unpopular Atlantic City Express ceased operations only a year later in 1995. Even though the inner city service left southern Jersey, the local NJT route stayed, as all NJT trains were extended into Philly's 30th Street station to fill in the gap left by Amtrak. Although, a very questionable part about this restored service and NJT takeover is that the present-day ACL service is listed on the original 1984 NJT map as a connecting service, even though the NJT ACL service did not start until 1989 and NJDOT service to Atlantic City ceased in 1981. Maybe this represented proposed service? I'm not really sure. But speaking of maps, sometime in the early 2000s, all of the NJT routes would get symbols associated with them, as the Atlantic City line gained a blue lighthouse signifying the location of Atlantic City being on the shoreline, and possibly for the Absicon lighthouse in the same city. Realizing how disconnected the Atlantic City line is from the rest of the system, NJT opened the Penn Salkin Transit Center in 2013, where it could transfer to the Riverline light rail for service to Trenton and Camden. Over the years, power on this branch became a bit more diverse for NJT, including exclusively single-level comic coaches with GP40s, along with the occasional GP40 FH-2s, PL42ACs, ALP45s, P40s, and even ALP44s. Kind of. The last of these two were for the Atlantic City Express Service, or ACES, a weekend solely express service running from 2009 to 2012 from New York Penn Station to Atlantic City by reversing at Philly and only stopped at Newark, and thus required electric power while under the wires, and was a rare instance of an electric engine in diesel territory. Although this line is one of a few examples of a North American rail line to be reactivated and mostly refurbished for commuter rail, there are still multiple problems with the route itself. First off, might as well point out that the timetable indicates there being one train every two hours, which isn't too bad in the grand scheme of things, but their on-time performance may be affected by the next aspect, the tracks. Almost the entire line is single tracked with a few passing sidings which already limits the capacity for any passenger train in addition to the occasional freight, and this isn't helped by every station except for Absicon and Cherry Hill being built on top of where the second track used to be. Once again, there are a few ultimate determinators which showcase that the entire line used to be double tracked, which isn't surprising based on its popularity back in the day. Speaking of ultimate determinators, there is one swing bridge that leads right into the station, but its low elevation results in a weird massive grade crossing with a connecting highway road right in between the station and the bay. But for the rest of the line, it uses the original Pensy route while the parallel Reading route was converted for miscellaneous purposes, clearly showcasing that the Pensy is the superior railroad. So one would think that all this branch needs is a second track and to move some platforms. Doesn't seem too bad. But then we get to Lindenwald, New Jersey, the place where Patco meets with the Atlantic City line. Alright, doesn't seem too bad at first. Looks like there's some room to add a second track. Alright, the bridge is a bit limiting, but there's probably some room to add a new bridge for a second track to the right. Okay, maybe we can negotiate that island platform to the right to have NJT service too. 
or use some of the parking lot space there to add a new track and platform. Oh my gosh. They trenched the track at Haddonfield. There can't be a second track without drastically reconstructing the station, which will cost millions of dollars. This one metro station single-handedly created an almost irreversible bottleneck for all heavy rail traffic on the route. And what's worse is that right after the station going north, the Atlantic City Line splits off and starts its rerouted journey towards Philly, and the next few Patco stations are elevated. Why couldn't this one be elevated too? There would at least be a chance of having some room for a second track to be installed, but this causes serious routing problems, which now involves serious reconsideration of the rail lines in the area if a direct, fully double-tracked mainline from Philadelphia to Atlantic City is obtainable. So this Patco subway route forces the ACL to divert past Cherry Hill and Pensalkin and onto the Delaware Bridge, a reroute that adds about an extra 10 miles to the trip and interfering with the already busy Northeast Corridor. As one can see, Patco has the more direct route from South Jersey into Philly, at the expense of the former PRSL route, while the existing NJT service has to go all the way around Frankfurt Junction at restricted speed in order to arrive at Philly much later than Patco but at least have some connections to other rail lines. Both alignments have their benefits and flaws, but one direct route cannot seem to exist with the other in its place. So how can this inconvenience be resolved? Well, it's a bit complicated. Before we dive into the confusing routing of the Philadelphia Rail Network, let's bring up one little point of interest that was mentioned in the last two episodes. Now I mentioned how the proposed Trans-Regional Express map indicated light rail conversions or other improvements on the IRR, Metro North, and NJT. But if you look closely at this proposed map, you can see that the Atlantic City Line DOESN'T EXIST! <laughs> this means that T-Rex either wants to 1. Abandon passenger service on the line in its entirety, or 2. Continue service as it is with no stated enhancements. I would hope the latter is true since the report brings up the ACL a few times, but doesn't state any plans for it. Likewise, there haven't been any direct plans to improve the line whatsoever since the Pennsylvania and Transfer Station, other than installing PTC which caused the whole line to be suspended for 8 months straight, as well as a possible NJT station at Woodcrest for a better transfer to Patco. Although, there is one project which has always been discussed for this route and others in the region, the Camden-Philadelphia Rail Tunnel. This monumental proposal was brought up as early as the late 1800s when the Delaware Bridge was constructed between North Philly and Pensalkin as an inconvenient but cheaper option when compared to a direct tunnel to the center of the city. Many have speculated that a more direct tunnel would have saved the South Jersey passenger rail routes since almost all of them terminated at Campton and transferred the ferries going to Philadelphia. Such successive tunneling has been evident for Pennsylvania commuter rail service in both New Jersey and Long Island in the Penn Station since it's much quicker to take one train right into the city instead of getting off at the shoreline and onto a slower ferry into the city itself. But back in South Jersey, some politicians have acknowledged that there is currently one commuter rail line in the region that you see about 10, and have proposed a similar solution as the existing Trenton to Camden service by essentially having a second river line from Camden to Glassboro. Since it's essentially a DMU on existing freight tracks with a few small stations, the project is relatively cheap and has made good progress over the years, but Glassboro isn't far enough to avenge commuter rail service further into the state, and it doesn't go into Philadelphia itself. That and it spurs at Glassboro which kind of caps any future expansion. So with all that said, what is my official diagnosis for the NJT Atlantic City line? Now before I get into this, please be advised that my main diagnosis may be a bit controversial, and is likely to start numerous debates in the comments. I can't simply say insert second track here and push back most of the station to call it A, oh no. Because that still doesn't address the single track bottleneck at Haddonfield, or better access to the city from Camden. Alright then, here we go. I propose, the best way to have direct service at Camden for the lowest possible cost while keeping most of the existing stations on the line, is to... Convert Patco.
Yes, I know it sounds dumb. Yes, I know many modifications are necessary for the tunnels and curves near Camden. Yes, I know there are other routing options that are available. Yes, I know the concept of converting almost an entire metro system to heavy rail has many challenges. Yes, I can hear some of you making a reaction video to this episode explaining why I'm wrong. Please don't roast me, Alan. I would never be able to financially recover from such a video. Speaking of Alan, let's bring up one of his earlier episodes of Armchair Urbanist, which just so happens to cover this very region. In his video, Alan suggests a more conventional rail tunnel which, despite its highly expensive cost, would connect to at least two existing heavy rail right-of-ways. While it's good to know that two heavy rail routes can be connected to a tunnel, the Atlantic City Line would either have to A, use the more direct Reading right-of-way from Winslow Junction and bypass the nearby Adco, Lindenwood, and Cherry Hill, or B, use the existing Pensy right-of-way to transfer onto the River Line while bypassing the Pensalk and Transfer Station thus going much further north to go all the way south. Basically, the most direct double-tracked route from Camden to the rest of South Jersey is the double-tracked Patco Speed Line, which itself was built on the original Camden and Atlantic alignment. Furthermore, there is another direct rail connection between Philly and Camden which existed since the 1930s, and that is none other than the Ben Franklin Bridge, which is also currently operated by Patco. Now yes, a few adjustments would have to be made for some of the curves, and the tunnels would have to be raised, but this link could easily connect with the existing set of Reading lines going into Jefferson Station. And as for the few remaining stations in the city, give them to the broad line as a loop or something like that, but that's besides the point. Yes, there would be some cost for converting almost all of Patco into a heavy rail line for the ACL, but utilizing the existing Ben Franklin Bridge may be cheaper than constructing a brand new rail tunnel in the same area. This would also bypass the NJT Cherry Hill Station, but that station was built in 1994 on a bypass that the PRSL almost never used for Philly service, so it wouldn't be too much of a loss in my opinion. No offense to anyone who uses Cherry Hill. On the other hand, the opposite form of rail transport on the route could work as well. That is, converting the ACL into a metro route operated by Patco. This would make the Patco Atlantic City Speed Line twice the length of the NYC A train and possibly one of the longest metro lines in the world at just over 60 miles long, quadrupling its current length. And considering service between Camden and Atlantic City was fully electrified at one point, at least when running via Newfield, using the third rail on a faster alignment isn't entirely out of the question. Although this would have costs of its own, including a third rail on the double tracked line all the way to Atlantic City, as well as possibly grades separating the route with elevated or underground stations. However, if you do want the ACL to enter Philly through a new heavy rail tunnel without converting Patco and keeping all the existing stations intact, there is one line that can be utilized. Said route runs through Merchantville and was originally part of a PRSL line that ran to Tom's River and all the way to Bayhead but has since been turned into a trail. As bad as it is for any rail line to be abandoned or repurposed for something other than rail transport, a rail trail at least preserves the original right-of-way should rail service return on the line. Now I did multiple calculations on the viability of restoring this more direct route from Cherry Hill to Camden, starting off with this ultimate determinator over Route 130. Oddly enough, the bridge only has enough room for one track, but its current location on the bridge's base seems to be right in between where two tracks used to fit. Furthermore, the junction at Merchantville connects with the current ACL route heading east towards Mount Holly, but there was never a junction between the ACL line going north and the Merchantville line going west towards Campton, likely because all South Jersey trains used the more direct Campton and Atlantic route to the Camden Ferry instead of using the current Delaware Bridge alignment to Philly. To determine if such a junction can fit, I highlighted the approximate length of one of Stepta's tightest curves just outside of Jefferson, and while using the same height dimensions above ground level, such a curve is almost possible, with just some land having to be acquired near the residential area. But even though this line would be perfect for heavy rail service while keeping all of Patco intact, it still relies on a currently non-existent Camden to Philly tunnel in order to guarantee a much quicker travel. And as far as the rest of the line goes, if possible I would just extend the trench at Haddonfield, even if it means reconstructing at least half of the station and losing a few parking spaces while costing millions of dollars to extend the trench. Other than insert second track here and push back all the stations except Absicon for the rest of the branch, I would also suggest elevating the Atlantic City station and the bridge that leads into it 
so this way it doesn't interfere with the highway. But this would be a low priority project since the station is fine with its five tracks. Or just build a connecting road over the highway so this way it doesn't interfere with any rail traffic. But overall, if you want the most direct service to Philly for the lowest construction cost, I would say convert Patco to heavy rail from Lindenwald to Philly via the Ben Franklin Bridge and make infrastructure modifications where necessary. And if you want the coveted Philly to Camden Rail Tunnel without converting Patco, connect the existing line to the Merchantville Rail Trail for the quickest journey to the city. And of course, in addition to the popularity of the Atlantic City Line, I would absolutely suggest the restoration of other XPRSL commuter service in South Jersey using the same infrastructure from Camden to Philly, namely the more popular ones such as Toms River, Salem, Bridgeton, Cape May, and Ocean City. For these services, I would prefer heavy rail over light rail due to more compatible infrastructure and for having more capacity when compared to small DMUs. But I wouldn't leave larger multiple units such as Sadler Flirts out of the question for these relatively short services. If implemented, then efficient passenger rail service could properly serve one of the most underrated regions in the Northeast and spur the development of an entirely new commuter rail corridor to better connect South Jersey not only to Philadelphia, but to the rest of the state as well. For this episode, the pick for honorable mention goes to the branch which was owned by the same railroad which had rail service in South Jersey, but was not part of the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines. And this railroad's former main line mostly still exists today as the Raritan Valley Branch. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. As indicated by the yellow-orange crop Statue of Liberty icon for the branch, this line was originally the main line for the Central Railroad of New Jersey, also known as the CNJ or Jersey Central. Founded in 1839, the line was extended several times throughout its history from Elizabethport all the way to Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania by 1866, with a good amount of branch lines in between, and just enough lines in Pennsylvania to take part in moving some sweet, sweet anthracite coal! But more on that in the next episode. This main line of the relatively small but mighty Jersey Central saw incredibly diverse power over the years ranging from unique steam engines to rare Fairbanks Morse diesels with heavy freights and various passenger trains with various consists. Sadly, the massive four-track main line will be reduced to two tracks while in New Jersey, with other portions in Pennsylvania being abandoned in favor of the parallel Lehigh Valley line, as the CNJ will be absorbed with other struggling northeastern railroads in the Conrail 1976. Although at this time, the CNJ was one of a handful of northeastern passenger railroads to continue commuter runs on their main line as their service to Phelpsburg was thankfully acquired by NJ Dot. But sadly, it would terminate at Newark Penn Station via the Aldine Connection as the entire four track main line between Cranford and the massive commuter pole terminal in Jersey City was entirely abandoned, with said terminal at least being preserved as a park. Today, the branch continues its predecessor's commuter tradition by running most trains to Raritan, with some trains extending past here to High Bridge and sees much more diverse power than the ACL, namely with Bombardier bi-levels and more importantly, dual-mode ALP-45s, which allow for direct Newark to Hoboken and New York Penn Station trips starting in the mid-2010s. Also, some points of interest on this line are Union, Rosell Park, and of course, the world-famous Bound Brook, since any publicly accessible place where two Class 1s meet equals great rail fanning opportunities. I must say, frequencies for this branch are great with one train every 30 minutes for rush hour service and once every hour for off-peak, along with service to High Bridge once every two hours since it's less densely populated. However, if there is one main, blaringly obvious hindrance for this line, it's that almost the entire route is at least one track deficient, in which the right-of-way west of Raritan only has one track when there used to be two, and east of Raritan only has two tracks when there very clearly used to be four in some areas 6. Also, don't be fooled by the ultimate determinator on Crossway Place in Westfield, since there's a plaque stating it was rebuilt into a double track bridge in 1999. And of course, zero tracks between Cranford and Commutapaw, when there used to be four, with the Bayonne Yard becoming an intermodal terminal and a lumber yard, and the Newark Bay Bridge being lost to the sea, all of which done in favor for, once again, the ex High Valley Bridge. Now one can argue that with most freight traffic using the ex High Valley main line, there isn't too much of a need to reinstall these extra tracks just for NJT and a few local freights. That is until 2021, when Amtrak released their Connexus map with a bunch of proposed passenger rail services across the nation. And by some chance, Amtrak recognized the CNJ's existence by proposing passenger service to Allentown on the former CNJ main line, 
and stops at Somerville, New Jersey, along with Easton and Bethlehem. Now, it's nice to see that Amtrak is proposing service on many of these former commuter routes, but the short length of these routes raises the question of whether these services are better as what they were in the past, commuter lines. I for one say yes, in which even though it's taking decades for commuter service to start to some of these places, especially the Lackawanna Cutoff to Scranton, these services will be much more frequent if they're operated by state agencies that operate these commuter services with a larger budget when compared to a federally funded service. Even SEPTA offered 9 trains a day for service to Reading when compared to Amtrak's 3 in their expansion plan, so it's assumed that NJT's frequencies would have the same ratio. If Amtrak really wants to use this line, however, then I suggest making their routes more than 90 miles long with stations more spaced out, by continuing along the former CNJ and Lehigh Valley to Scranton to connect with the Lackawanna Cutoff, and maybe go even further by following the route of the Phoebe Snow to Buffalo through Binghamton. Another good nearest city in line would be connecting Allentown to Reading and continuing to Harrisburg. But the point is any rail line that's under 120 miles should be left to commuter rail agencies like NJT for more frequent service, especially since NJT already stated interest in extending the Raritan Valley line to Allentown, and anything over that should really be left for inner city companies like Amtrak. But in the meantime, with this new edition of Amtrak service coming soon, I think it's pretty obvious what my official diagnosis would be for this branch. Avenge the removed tracks. This line has so much potential to expand and connect with other inner city and commuter lines alike, and the line must have enough capacity to include such demands. Basically, push back almost all of the platforms one track length and fill in the gaps with tracks. As for the section between Cranford and Commuterpaw, I would also suggest restoring the four tracked main line to Elizabethport and double track to a restored Commuterpaw station or a new alignment to Hoboken station. This route can either see regular passenger service from the RVL, or if demand is too low, then use the line for shuttle trains like the CNJ and Conrail did in the 1970s. And the freight railroads would benefit from the Cranford section as a few new switches could allow new access to the absolutely massive and vital Port Newark. Thank you all for watching this episode of Fixing Your Branch Line. Somehow, this branch turned out to be more intense with research than the previous episode, mostly due to the fact that Philadelphia railroading is complicated, and I had to consider every possible route under a variety of circumstances, such as the addition of a Philly to Camden rail tunnel. I mean, just looking at the NJT map, I knew I had to cover the Atlantic City line since it's disconnected from the rest of the system, but I wasn't counting on the complex history of the branch and its previous owner, let alone the various routing options of Philly. Likewise, the honorable mention of the Raritan Valley line also led to a little explanation of why I feel Amtrak should focus on running longer intercity routes and leave anything under 120 miles to commuter agencies. This video also included multiple aerial views on both Google Maps and Rail Guide, which helped showcase my various reasons for each statement. Again, I would like to emphasize that the solutions I offer in this video are not the only ways to fix the branch, and if you have any idea on how to efficiently route the Atlantic City Line and other potential South Jersey commuter lines, please let me know in the comments. So with all of that said, thank you again for watching. Credit for all the photographs used go to their respective photographers. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe for more. Have a good day.